Good morning. Welcome to Contact's uh, webinar on transport. Um, presented today by Stuart Hall of Wiltshire Parent Carer Council and Kay Henry of Parent Carers Cornwall. Welcome to this Contact webinar. If there is a technical hitch, please do bear with us. Those of you joining by PC, laptop, tablet or smartphone should now be able to see this introduction slide. As there are so many attendees, you will all remain muted throughout. To ask a question of the presenter, please use the question icon on your GoToWebinar toolbar on your screen. This will allow you to type your question into the text box and submit this to the webinar administrator. We will select as many relevant questions to answer as time allows, and if similar questions are received, we will condense these where possible. Further relevant questions that are not covered in the time allowed will be answered and posted on the contact website along with the recording of this webinar, details of which will be circulated next week. We are hoping to produce an FAQ document to cover any questions that we receive through the webinar today. At the end of the webinar, a short questionnaire will launch. Please take the time to complete this as this will assist with the future online training events. In this webinar, we will be concentrating on legislation reduced to consult, transport issues identified by parent carers, challenges and budget pressures, different approaches, your suggestions, future developments, transport guide, what can you do, and then questions. We would like us to point out that we're not legal experts and as such we won't be able to answer questions of a legal nature. Instead, we hope to present information to clarify understanding. Towards the end of the webinar, we'd like to give an opportunity for participants to offer suggestions and experiences to help build a bigger collective experience and understanding of SEN transport across the country. Legislation, in brief, the law states that children under five are not automatically entitled to transport. Children aged five to 16 may get free suitable home to school transport to the nearest suitable qualifying school. Young people aged 16 to 19, the law requires local authorities to have a transport policy statement. We'd just like to say here that there isn't an overriding transport policy. Each local authority does produce their own. Young people aged 19 and over, the LA must make such arrangements for the provision of transport as they consider necessary. Appealing decisions start by making an appeal through the LA's own internal appeals procedure. So that will be the local authorities procedure in your areas. We'll look at the legislation in a little more detail over the next few slides. So to begin with, considering children under five years old. Children who are under compulsory school age are not automatically entitled to transport to an early year setting or school. Compulsory school age begins on the first day of the term following the child's fifth birthday. For children in early year settings, section 509A of the Education Act 1996 gives local authorities the discretion to make travel arrangements for children receiving early years education other than in a school. Local authorities are not permitted to fetter their discretion. This means they cannot refuse to make a transport arrangement simply because they have no strict duty to make it. For children who are at school but are under the compulsory school age, section 508C of the Education Act 1996 also gives local authorities a discretionary power to make such school travel arrangements as they consider necessary for the purpose of facilitating the child's attendance at school. 
If your local authority refuses to provide transport and you feel it is necessary, for example, because your child has a particular disability and there is no other way to get them to nursery or school, then you could appeal against their decision. For children aged 5 to 16, eligible, eligible children fall within four categories. There are children with SEN, a disability or a mobility difficulty, children whose route to school is unsafe, children who live beyond the statutory walking distance, and children from low income families. Local authorities are required to arrange free, suitable home to school transport for children of compulsory school age who are eligible to their nearest suitable qualifying school. And this is detailed in section 508B of the Education Act 1996. We'll explain the different categories in detail over the next slides. So the first category, children with SEN, a disability or a mobility difficulty. If your child fits into this category, which means they cannot reasonably be expected to walk to school, then they are an eligible child and they are entitled to home to school transport that is provided by the local authority. That is as long as the local authority has made no suitable arrangements for attendance at a near school or a boarding or residential accommodation. It may not be reasonable to expect a child to walk to school because of a physical disability, but it may also be because, for example, they lack a sense of danger. If a child is eligible because they have SEN, a disability or mobility problems, whether or not they live within statutory walking distance of the school, it is not relevant. If their SEN or disability does not hinder their ability to walk to school, they may be eligible under one of the other categories of children of compulsory school age. For children with education, health and care, EHCP, it is not uncommon for local authorities to ask parents to pay for transport when there is a dispute over the placement, which should be named in the EHCP, particularly when the placement is at the parents' preferred school and may cost more than the local authority's nearest alternative school. However, IPSI advises that parents should only enter into such an agreement if the school which the local authority wishes the child to attend is in fact suitable and the local authority can show that the parent's preferred school would be an inefficient use of the local authority's resources. You should consider, is the school that the local authority is proposing suitable for your child and is it able to provide them with a place if they were asked to do so? If the answer is yes, would yours as the, parents, um, as the parent preference cost significantly more than the local authority's preference and that would include the combined cost of travel to both schools? If the answer to both of the above questions is yes, then the local authority is entitled to ask the parent to pay the cost of transport. Section one of the EHCP would be likely to say something like, the local authority considers the child's needs can be met at a school, the nearest appropriate school to the child's home. But in accordance with the parental preference, the child will be attending B school on the condition that the parents arrange and if necessary pay for the transport to and from B school. However, if the answer to the first or second question is no, then the parents choice of school should be named unconditionally. The parent's choice of school is then deemed to be the nearest suitable school and the local authority must provide transport if it is necessary. 
If the local authority has written a sentence into section one of the EHCP stating that parents must provide transport when you do not consider the conditions above have been met, IPSI suggests that you should consider appealing to the first tier tribunal to get this sentence removed so your preferred school is named unconditionally for the purpose of receiving transport. And we recognise there's a lot of information in these slides which you're not seeing on the screens, but these slides will be available on the contact website some weeks after this webinar has finished broadcasting, so you will be able to access all of the, the notes along uh, with this presentation today. So moving on to the next uh, criteria, this is about children whose route to school is unsafe. If the route to the school is unsafe, and if the child lives within statutory walking distance of the school, and the local authority has not made arrangements for the child to attend a nearer qualifying school, the local authority must make suitable travel arrangements free of charge. The local authority should assess the route at the times the child would be using it, and this should take into account the age of the child whether risks might be less if the child were accompanied by an adult and whether that is practicable. The width of the road and the existence of pavements, the volume and speed of traffic, street lighting and different conditions at different times of the year. And then moving on to children who live beyond the statutory walking distance. Children who attend schools beyond the statutory walking distance are eligible for free school transport, provided that the local authority has made no suitable arrangements for attendance at a near school or boarding accommodation. And that is described as two miles from the school for children under eight and three miles for those who are over eight. Section 444 of the Education Act 1996 says that the distance between home and school is the nearest available route along which a student accompanied as necessary can walk with reasonable safety to school. Remember, however, that if you meet one of the other criteria, for example, because your child could not reasonably be expected to walk to school because of their special educational needs or disability, then you could be entitled to transport even if you live within the statutory walking distance. And finally, children from low income families. The child may qualify for potential eligibility under the low income provisions if they're entitled to free school lunches or if their parents or carers receive working tax credit at the maximum rate. Junior age children, that is those who are aged eight to 10 years old from low income families who live more than two miles, rather than three, from their nearest suitable school become eligible for free school transport from the local authority. Children under eight who live more than two miles from their nearest suitable school are eligible under the statutory walking distance category. Secondary school age, children from low income families who attend schools over two and up to six miles from their home will be eligible for free school transport even if the school they attend is not their nearest suitable school providing there are not three or more suitable schools which are nearer to their home secondary school aged children from low income families who attend a school over two miles but under 50 miles away from home will be entitled to free school transport if their parents has expressed a wish for them to be educated at that particular school based on the parents religion or belief and having regard to that religion or belief there is no nearer suitable school this applies to parents with a particular religious or philosophical belief including those with a lack of religion or lack of belief. Secondary age pupils from low income families who receive education elsewhere 
than in school. For example, if the child is excluded from school and is receiving education at an alternative provision placement, which is over two and up to six miles from their home, will also be eligible for local authority school transport, whether or not there is a nearer suitable school. So what about young people aged 16 to 19? Where a young person is of sixth form age and is attending school or college, the law requires local authorities to have a transport policy statement that sets out home to school or college transport arrangements for particular groups of young people. And this is detailed in section 509AA of the Education Act 1996 should be able to find your local authorities transport policy statement on your council website and hopefully it's also within the local offer there is statutory guidance post 16 transport to education and training concerning the groups of young people local authorities should prioritize and this includes young people with special educational needs Sixth form age means that they are over compulsory school age. And this ends on the last Friday in June in the academic year in which they turn 16, but they must be under 19. If a young person began the course they're studying at school or college before their 19th birthday, they remain at sixth form age until they complete that course. Legislation gives local authorities the discretion to determine what transport and financial support are necessary to facilitate young people's attendance. The local authority must exercise its power to provide transport or financial support reasonably, taking into account all relevant matters. And a failure to make the, arra make the arrangements that are specified in the transport policy statement or ensure that such arrangements are made would amount to a failure to fully meet the duty. Although there's no automatic entitlement to transport for those of sixth form age in the same way there is for eligible children of compulsory school age, local authorities have a discretion to assist with transport arrangements and are expected to target support towards students in particular circumstances, such as those with SEN or from low income families. It is unlikely that such transport will be free. The purpose of the transport policy statement is to specify the arrangements for the provision of transport that the local authority considers it necessary to make to facilitate the attendance of all persons in sixth form age receiving education or training. When assessing what transport arrangements or financial assistance may be required, the local authority should consider the needs of the most vulnerable or socially excluded learners. The needs of learners with learning difficulties and or disabilities should be specifically considered and the arrangements in place for each group must be documented in the transport policy statement. If the young person is 19 or over, the local authority's duty in respect of adult learners is covered by section 508F of the Education Act 1996. Adult learners will be young people over sixth form age. Those who are 19 are. Remember, if they started a course of further education before their 19th birthday, they remain in sixth form age until they have completed that. Course. When considering adult learners, the local authority must make such arrangements for the provision of transport as they consider necessary and must do for two purposes. The first purpose is to facilitate the attendance of adults receiving education at institutions. These could be maintained or assisted by the authority and providing further or higher education or even both or within the further education sector. 
any transport arrangements provided under this duty must be free of charge. Local authorities have duties under Section 508G of the Education Act 1996 to consult with further education colleges and others about the fulfilment of their duties towards adult learners. And they must publish a policy on how they will do so. The first place to look when looking for information about post-16 home to school college transport arrangements is likely to be the local authorities transport policy statement on post-16 transport. And this policy should also address travel arrangements for those who are adult learners. Remember, this policy should sit on the council website and also on the local offer website. If an adult learner has an EHCP, then this could well strengthen the argument that travel arrangements are necessary. The local authority has a duty to secure the special educational provision specified within the EHCP and will have real difficulty doing so if the young person can't get to college to access that provision. Even if they do not consider it necessary, the local authority has a discretion to pay some or all of the reasonable cost of transport if no other arrangement has been made under section 508F of the Education Act. And they must exercise their judgment judiciously and in good faith. So the transport policy is, is really crucial to making sure that you understand what provision is made for your children and young people within your local authority. And if you have an issue with how transport needs are being met, then you'll want to understand how you can appeal decisions. For children with EHC plans, issues around transport can become relevant in an appeal about the school named in Section 1 of an EHCP. And transport costs are relevant to the cost of a particular school and placement. It is possible to appeal Section 1 of an EHCP to have a sentence about responsibility for transport removed. Though we talked before that sometimes Section 1 could say that it's the parent's responsibility to meet the costs of transport. The SEND Tribunal does not have jurisdiction to deal with disputes about transport alone, so it has got to be in relation to education provision. If you disagree with a decision made about transport, you need to start by making an appeal through the local authority's own internal appeals procedures. All local authorities should have an appeals procedure for parents to use when they have a complaint about the service or they disagree with the eligibility of their child for travel support. The government's guidance, home to school travel and transport guidance 2014 says that the details of the appeals procedures should be published alongside local authority travel policy statements. If you're unhappy with your local authority's decision about your child's transport to school, write to the transport section of your local council to ask for a copy of the policy and appeal procedures. Remember, your local authority is required to publish this information and make it readily available to you as part of its local offer. If you consider that there's been a failure to comply with the procedural rules of an appeal, or if there are any other irregularities in the way the appeal was handled, you may have a right to complain to the local government and social care ombudsman, often known as the LGSCO. In an extreme case, it may be possible for the process by which the decision was reached to be challenged through judicial review proceedings if the decision was unlawful, irrational or unjust. 
We've got a few questions that are starting to, to come in. Um, we're not going to answer those questions as we go through the slides. Uh, we've built in a QA and a um, section, so we will respond to as many of those questions as we can when we get to that Q&A section. Taking a look at the SEND code of practice, the, we all recognise that transport can be a very important factor in the support for children and young people with SEND or disabilities. The local offer must include information about arrangements for transport provision, including for those up to age 25 within the HCP. And this should include local authorities' policy statements. The SEND code of practice clearly states in section 4.49 that local authorities must ensure that suitable travel arrangements are made where necessary to facilitate an eligible child's attendance at a school. Section 508B of the Education Act 1996 requires local authorities to make such school travel arrangements as they consider necessary for children within their area. Such arrangements must be provided free of charge. Section 508C of the Act gives local authorities discretionary powers to make school travel arrangements for other children not covered by Section 508B. Such transport does not have to be provided free of charge. Section 4.50 of the SEND Code of Practice says that local authorities must publish a transport policy statement each year setting out the travel arrangements they will make to support young people aged 16 to 19 and learners with learning difficulties and or disabilities aged up to 25 to access further education. This should include arrangements for free or subsidised transport. Transport policies. As we said before, all local authorities have their own transport policies, so they may, may be different from area to area across the country. The policies need to be clear, easy to understand and accurate for each region. Information about policies can be found on the local offer which should be available through the statutory service within all local authorities. They should provide all accurate information about school transport in each of your areas and ensure information is in line with the school admission round. We're just going to take a brief look at transport in terms of short break provision. There's no specific requirement to provide transport as part of short break regulations in the Breaks for Carers of Disabled Children Regulations 2011. And having had a look at what those regulations stipulate, we can see that there is a duty to make provision in performing their duty under paragraph 61C of Schedule 2 of the 1989 Act and it says that local authority must have regard to the needs of those carers who would be unable to continue to provide for care unless breaks from caring were given to them and have regard to the needs of those carers who would be able to provide care for their disabled child more effectively if breaks from caring were given to them to allow them to undertake education, training or any regular leisure activity. Meet the needs of other children in the family more effectively or carry out day to day tasks which they must perform in order to run their household. Types of services which must be provided in performing their duty under paragraph 61C of Schedule 2 of the 1989 Act says the local authority must provide, so far as is reasonably practicable, a range of services 
which is sufficient to assist carers to continue to provide care or to do so more effectively. In particular, the local authority must provide as appropriate a range of daytime care in the homes of disabled children or elsewhere, overnight care in the homes of disabled children or elsewhere, educational or leisure activities for disabled children outside their homes, and services available to assist carers in the evenings, at weekends, and during the school holidays. Now, there are obviously going to be eligibility criteria attached to all of those, but it may possibly mean that transport forms part of that provision dependent on individual need. It is written in legislation that a local authority must, by the 1st of October 2011, prepare a statement for carers in their area called Short Breaks Services Statement. And this must set out details of the range of services provided in accordance with Regulation 4. Any criteria by which eligibility for those services will be assessed and how the range of services is designed to meet the needs of carers in their area. The local authority must publish their short break services statement, including by placing a copy of the statement on their website. We would expect to see that on the local offer website as well. The local authority must keep their short break services statement under review and where it is appropriate, revise that statement. In preparing and revising their statement, the local authority must have regard to the views of carers in their area. This is where the voice of parent carers is really important. The other piece of legislation that we found that seemed uh, relevant was the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970. This does make reference to transport in section 26D. And it says, as such, the local authority will have a duty to meet the full cost of transport to activities such as short breaks if this is a necessary service. And that would go back to um, eligibility criteria. Due to consult. Public bodies must consult in good time. There must be enough information. There must be enough time for responses. And there must be genuine consideration of the responses. And due to consult, Steve Broach, barrister at Doherty Street Chambers and specialising in cases involving disabled children and others who need care and support from public bodies, wrote a paper called Using the Law to Fight Cuts to Disabled Children's Services. The paper details what, what the duty consult looks like. The paper begins by explaining that the first and most important point to understand on consultation is that whether or not there is a duty to consult. Once a public body decides to consult, it has to do so properly. In other words, whether consultation is a duty or a choice, once launched, the standard and quality of the consultation has to be the same. If changes to transport are proposed, it is likely that a consultation will take place. It may be helpful to understand if LAs have to consult, as this can be helpful in challenging decisions. For example, has due process been observed? Secondly, even if there is no specific duty to consult on a particular issue, parents forums and other local groups may well have a legitimate expectation that will, there will be a consultation about changes to services that affect their families. If any local group becomes aware of a significant change to services, 
which has taken place in their area without consultation, they may wish to take legal advice as quickly as possible. Once consultation is begun, the courts have specified that four things must be in place to make it lawful. One, public bodies must consult in good time so that responses to the consultation can still genuinely be taken into account before the final decision is made. Two, there must be enough information so that people responding to the consultation understand the proposals and can make an informed response. Three, there must be enough time for responses. Whether enough time has been given will be judged by the court. If the consultation is challenged on the facts of the individual case, However, a very short consultation over a school holiday period is unlikely to be enough time. There must be genuine consideration of the responses, not just lip service paid to them, if a particular consultation does not match up to these requirements. Any family potentially affected by the proposed changes can bring an application for judicial review in the High Court challenge the consultation. If the court agrees that the consultation is unlawful, then the court will squash the consultation and in effect make the public body start again and do it properly the next time. Doing it properly may involve considering whether other potentially less detrimental alternatives are available. For example, increasing council tax for everyone rather than removing services for vulnerable groups. Due to consult challenging school transport policies on the contacts website, information for families requiring to consult, common reasons to challenge a local school transport policy and further information on how to do so is available on contact families website. Local authorities set their own school transport policies. These policies must comply with the law. Research contact carried out as part of their school transport inquiry has shown that a number of policies do not comply with the law. Contact is also aware of parent groups who have successfully challenged potentially unlawful policies when they have been put out for consultation. Local authorities in England must publish policies for the following age groups. This transport policy must be published under the Education School Information Regulations 2002 as amended. It must form part of the composite prospectus, a document the local authority publishes annually to show admission arrangements for state funded schools in the area. The composite prospectus must be published by the 12th of September, the year before admissions. Statutory guidance, home to school, travel and transport guidances states that the information in the policy should be clear and easy to understand, give full information on travel and transport arrangements, explain both statutory transport provision and that provided on a discretionary basis. Set out the appeal process. The law does not say how or when the local authority should, control, should consult on transport policies for this age group. Statutory guidance recommends that local authorities should consult widely on any changes that interested with parties for at least 24 days during term time. Young people of sixth form age, 16 to 18. 
Under Section 509AA of the 1996 Education Act, the local authority must publish a transport policy statement for 16 to 18 year olds. This must be published by the 31st of May to take effect with the next academic year from September. Local authorities must have regard to statutory guidance post-16 transport to education and training. When drawing up the policy for this age group, there are legal requirements for who must be involved in the consultation, including young people and their parents. Relevant young adults, 16 to 18 year olds, with an education, health and care plan under section 508G of the 1996 Education Act. The local authority must publish a transport policy. Statement for relevant young adults who are, ident who are entitled to tra transport under the adult transport duty. Relevant young adults are defined as those under 25 with an EHCP plan. Although the guidance still uses the old terminology subject to learning difficulty assessment. The policy must be published by the 31st of May to take effect the next academic year, for example, from September. There are legal requirements for who must be involved in the consultation, including relevant young adults and their parents. Many local authorities consult on an all age groups as part of the same consultation. Local authorities must publish details of school transport for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities in their local offer. This is set out in Special Educational Needs and Disabilities Regulations 2014. Consultations. A formal consultation is when a public body, such as the local authority, seeks the views of stakeholders on a new policy. A proposed change to eligibility criteria or other policy changes. Case law has established the general principles of consultation. Consultation must be proportionate and fair. In particular, consultation should happen when proposals are still being developed. It should be possible to change proposals in light of the consultation. Stakeholders must be given enough reasons for the proposals to allow them to make an informed response. Consultees should be provided not only with information about proposals such as a draft scheme or policy but also with an outline of the realistic alternatives and an indication of the main reasons for the authority's adoption of its preferred option. Stakeholders must have adequate time to consider and respond to the proposals. The outcome of the consultation should be taken into account. It may be possible to mount a legal challenge by a judicial review if a consultation has not been carried out fairly. If a person is likely to lose something or be worse off, then they should be specifically identified and consulted. In Haringey, all those affected were written to and the letters were hand delivered. This is considered to be sound practice. Some common reasons to challenge a local school transport policy. Contact identified some issues in proposed and actual school transport policies. These issues are potentially, and in some cases, actually unlawful and could be a reason to challenge the policy. Inadequate consultation, for example, 
If stakeholders are not aware of changes, don't have enough time to respond, or if responses are limited to an online questionnaire. Inadequate policies. When the transport policy does not comply with the recommendations set out in statutory guidance, common, issue, common issues are the policy is difficult to understand for the average parent. The policy does not include all eligibility criteria, for example, children with SEND or mobility difficulties. There is limited information on how to apply or appeal. Blanket policies that restrict eligibility. Some local authorities have blanket policies that limit eligibility to children with SEND who live outside the statutory walking distance, have an EHC plan or one that specifies transport arrangements, attend out of authority schools, attend special schools, have physical and medical difficulties only. Policies like these are not lawful. However, local authorities are only obliged to provide transport to the nearest suitable school and can refuse transport if parents choose a further school away. To be considered suitable, a school must be right for the child's age, ability and aptitude, as well as being able to meet their son. The policy, sheet, policy should explain this. Requiring parents to arrange transport. This includes forcing parents to accept a mileage allowance or individual travel budget. Expecting families with a mobility car to drive their children to school. Expecting families to use a higher rate mobility component payment to pay for school transport. This is all unlawful. The local authority must provide travel arrangements for eligible children. Mileage allowances or use of the parental car can only be with the parents' consent. This states it in the Education Act 1996, section 508B. Further information about quality issues, including under fives, travel training, no door to door travel arrangements, and arranging for travel for post 16s, is available on Contacts Wait websites. We can display the link to this on the next slide. As you can see, the link is there, which is available on Contacts Families website. Also, more information about challenging school transport policies is also available for you to view on Contact Families website. How to have your say. Check your local offer for information guiding you to how you can have your say and if there is anything that you would like to appeal. Respond to consultations. If you think there is something wrong with an existing transport policy, make a formal complaint to your local authority. You can also contact the education team on Contacts Helpline for further advice if you need to. We can talk a little bit more later about how to engage positively, positively with your local authority. Home to school travel and transport guidance. More information about transport legislation, eligibility, etc. can be found online on Contacts website. Home to school travel and transport guidance. All details can be found on Contact Families website and you can also download their fact sheets. We've done a bit of research uh, trying to identify some of the issues that um, parent carers are identifying about transport across the country. 
And an organization called STC have done um, quite a bit of work on this. We're going to um, discuss what they found through the, the next few slides. STC is a UK specialist school travel and transport consultancy company. And they work for local authorities and bus operators for schools and colleges and other organizations involved in passenger transport. STC surveyed, has surveyed local authorities since the 1980s to monitor school transport provision. The 2016 survey exposed wide differences in school transport availability across the UK and raised concern about substantial cuts being made for vision in England. This year's survey shows that children in England continue to bear the brunt of severe transport cuts. STC's report identifies that to manage budgets, local authorities are cutting discretionary mainstream and post-16 transport, raising charges and tightening um, entitlement criteria, meaning that what is provided is now usually only the statutory minimum and for those with severe or complex special needs. Their report goes on to say that funding remains authorities' main concern, but the rise in school population and shortages of places are having an impact on transport as well. According to STC, in 2016-17, expenditure on school transport in England has risen to £1.114 billion a year, which is up from £1.062 billion in 2014-15. SEN transport costs have continued to rise and account for a growing proportion of spend and pupils receiving transport to £732 million in England, accounting for two thirds of expenditure and more than 22% of pupils qualifying. STC has calculated that for pupils with special needs, the average cost of transport is £4,881 a year, which is equivalent to £26 a day. Authorities can charge pupils who receive transport on a discretionary basis, for example, if they're aged over 16, and they're increasingly applying and increasing charges to those over 16 years of age with and without special needs. 17 of the authorities responding to the survey, which equates to 32%, said they continue to provide some free post-16 transport but the majority now charge or make no post-16 transport provision. Charges currently range from £168 a year to £900 a year. The majority of local authorities responding to STC survey have and or are planning to make further changes to entitlement policies for school transport to enable them to manage budgets. This year's survey confirms that further cuts to SEM transport and post-16 transport and continued increases in charges are expected. Authorities are reported, also reported undertaking other measures to manage costs and improve efficiency. The most frequently cited measures being replanning, the retendering of networks and changing to procurement systems and also the promotion of independent travel. Some authorities also said that they promoted the use of personal travel budgets in lieu of providing transport. Authorities also made various suggestions as to what would improve the situation, with some arguing that the law urgently requires review because funding is short. An STC's report suggests that conversely, it could be argued that this key service for young people requires additional investment rather than cutting the service to suit the budget. 53 local authorities responded to STC survey, which represents 30% of all the authorities in England and 26% of all the authorities in the UK. Respondents to, the sur respondents to the survey included three London boroughs, 14 metropolitan boroughs, 15 shire counties, four unitary authorities, 
four Scottish authorities and three Welsh authorities. STC's report update can be found on their website www.school-transport.com forward slash about hyphen STC forward slash 2018 hyphen survey hyphen results. School Transport Inquiry. Contact School Transport Inquiry found that 48% and mostly mums said that school travel arrangements for their disabled children meant that they can't work or have had to decrease working hours. 23% said that their child's journey to school is stressful, which of course makes it harder for their child to learn. 51% of local school transport policies in England include unlawful statements. The decision has been made as a result of findings from Contact School Transport Inquiry. The School Transport Inquiry brings together evidence from more than 2,500 parents. Contact discovered that 48% and mostly mums said that trans transport arrangements for their child meant that, as I've already said, were unable to work or they had to decrease their working hours. These findings were informed by evidence received from the contact helpline, responses from more than 2,500 parents who took part in an online survey with submissions made by the National Network of Parent Care Forums and other stakeholders, including the University of Leeds and transport providers. As a result, the Secretary of State for Education committed to revise the statutory guidance on home to school transport for children of compulsory school age in response to contact inquiry into school transport for disabled children. We are running slightly over with all the information we are giving you and we're happy to stay online to continue with this webinar. To find out more about contact school transport inquiry, the link on this slide will take you to contact's website where you will find more information, including what the inquiry found, the full report, what contact wants to achieve, what, what contact is doing, as well as further information, help and advice. If you have been refused school transport or want to find out more about the rights to school transport. Different approaches to providing transport. Many local authorities are now looking more creatively with budget cuts increasing all the time. We are aware of many organisations and local authorities who have been working together to look at creative approaches to delivering transport in some areas around the county and countries, including travel training, free bus passes, personal budgets to pay for petrol and mileage, school run transport, schools only a fleet of minibuses and run their own transport. They often use their own TAs as PAs, central pickup points which children collected from centralised locations to reduce travel time and cost, e auctions for providers where suppliers put in their lowest bids online, allocated persons with the LA focused on route reviews and route planning. Purchasing own transport fleet, for example, a fleet of minibuses that the LA purchases and employs drivers to run. Cheaper than minibuses, both in terms of running costs and purchase hire. Joining with day or health services, for example, for community transport. Car sharing schemes, parents are linked to share their own transport. What are your experiences of creative approaches to providing transport in your area? Do you have any creative suggestions? 
We're going to take a minute now to take examples and suggestions and suggestions from our participants. So we've had a um, suggestion from Richard in Somerset. Um, families are offered a personal transport plan where you receive money to organise your transport yourself, which I think is fairly similar to the, the personal budget scheme that, that Kay mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, thank you, Richard, for kindly sharing that suggestion. Thank you. Future developments, transport guidance. Following on from the school transport inquiry that, tra that contact did and working with the Department of Education on the review of guidance, they're hopeful that it will soon come out for public consultation. What can you do as forums and as parents carers? You can take an active role as a positive partner. Forums can have conversations with commissioners in your local areas to find out about tendering dates. They can make sure that they are involved in the commissioner's process right from the start. You can build relationships with the manager, manager of transport and engage with parent carers in your area to find out if any issues which then can be fed back on transport to the commissioners and managers in your areas. Remember the duty to consult as we have mentioned. Transport policies should explain how decisions can be challenged. Forums work together from the start with leads of transport is essential. You can challenge following the same procedures as parents and the DfE has said if forums are not happy about situations after they have been trying to work hard with the local authority, they can go through the local authority complaints procedures in your areas if you've exhausted everything else. Forums could do a survey with families to build on evidence base. Obviously, if you know there's a particular issue within your area, that's your opportunity to build up within that evidence. The local authority ombudsman has said a forum could make a complaint to them if they are not happy with the local authority's decisions. Within Cornwall, I can give you an example. Two years ago, we had concerns regarding our post-16 transport. A consultation went out where communication to parents wasn't really achievable because nobody actually was aware of it at the time. When it was seen by parents and carers, it was felt that it wasn't fit for purpose. It was a lot of legal jargon, which was very difficult for parents and carers to understand. And also what they were requesting in the consultation for change, again, would not have been fit for purpose for the young people's needs. As a forum, we met with our leads of transport again and had discussions about the feedback we'd been receiving from parents and carers. We arranged a meeting both with several parents and carers. We gained evidence from a survey that we did at the time, and we held a meeting with all parties involved, including local authority leads and SEND leads. Following on from that meeting, both sides realised that mistakes had been made, especially the local authority leads. The consultation was rewritten and a number of the things they were hoping to achieve through changes was actually dissolved. After a follow on meeting from that, it was actually decided by the local authority that what they were Riding was actually not going to be fit for purpose, and I'm glad to say that particular year those changes were scrapped. So, as a forum, if you have issues in your areas, the one thing we would suggest is make sure that you have those good working relationships with your leads in transport and commissioning. 
What can you do? In summary, take an active role with your local authority as a positive partner. As I say, engage with parent carers to enable informed conversations with your LA. Remember the legislation and duty to consult. Identify issues early and have conversations with your LA. If all else fails, forums can follow the same complaints procedure as I said, as the individual parents and carers. When engaging with your LA, having engaged with parent carers, be clear when having conversations with the commissioners and reporting back, you do know, for example, the range of disabilities, needs or health conditions of the children and young people. Parental confidence and transport options, this again could have been evidenced through surveys or talking to several parent carers. Parent satisfaction in transport provision, again feedback from the voice of the parent carer. What do parents say is working well? What do parents say could be done differently or better? And what suggestions do parents have for doing things differently within the available budget? Q&A. So we're going to take a moment to um, have a look at the questions that have been coming in during the, the presentation of the slides. We received quite a, a significant amount of questions during this presentation and there won't be enough time to respond to all of the questions. And also I think quite a few of the questions that we've seen so far are of um, a fairly technical or legal nature and what we wouldn't want to do is to give any incorrect or misleading information. So it is quite likely that a lot of the questions uh, we would want to go back to to consult to make sure that the information that we gave was legally correct and we would like to do that by a, um, an FAQ document that we post on contacts website along with this webinar um, in a few weeks time. Um, I appreciate that, that that might be a little bit frustrating if you've got a burning question that you want answered straight away. But as I say, the last thing we want to do is give any uh, information that, that isn't true, accurate um, or was misleading. If you could just bear with us for a couple of moments while we have a look at some of the questions um, and we will be back with you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for your patience. We're, we're back. Um, we've had a discussion about the, the numerous questions that have come in. Um, we really have only got time to, to respond to a few of those, but please be assured that all questions that have been asked um, will be posted as part of the, the Q&A document following this webinar. So one of the questions that came in was about inward facing dash cams. Um, in vehicles and the, the question was can parents view these recordings if parents completed permission slips um, and the recommend the, the suggestion was that it would be particularly helpful to parents to children young people particularly if they're non-verbal so that the parents could understand better why their child might be distressed following their journey um, our feeling is that this is quite a complex legal um, question and we would want to seek uh, some, some legal uh, reassurance before providing a response to that one. So we wanted to acknowledge that we've received the question. We felt it was a really interesting question, but we will have a conversation with um, legal and post a, a response as part of the Q&A document. Um, another question that we've had come in is regarding training um, from Richard. Thank you for the question. It's involving all professionals who work with children and young people to have training within SEND to understand the children's needs before they become involved in their roles. We'd agree with you on this, if it's available. One of the things I know other forums have done is actually they've gone in and worked with their local authorities and their staff and delivered training to them, whether it's disability awareness or about specific conditions that can help um, the local authority understand with the children and young people. Um, 
as a forum ourselves within Cornwall, when we've held consultations with our SEND leads, we've also specified this very thing that professionals working with children and parents um, should have designated training. We're glad that within, certainly within transport, training needs have been met, not only with professionals working with children and families, but also staff like within the transport needs from minibuses or taxis. But I'd certainly try and get your forum involved to work with your local authority um, on this issue. And if you can't deliver it yourself as a forum, see if there's other organisations who you could probably highlight and see if the local authority will take this on. Okay, so we've got one regarding Julia's contract question, um, where you'd like to know if contracts awarded can be shared with your forum and parents and carers. We feel that as long as there is no conflict of interest where you might have a personal involvement with anybody who may be involved with the delivery of the contracts, and also if there is confidentiality clauses, then there's no reason why you shouldn't actually be seeing the contracts from your local authority. And then the final question that we're going to, to share within this webinar today is an interesting question from Lorraine. And Lorraine has, has stated that personal transport uh, budgets not high enough to cover petrol wear and tear on a vehicle and reduced hours of, of work um, and we just felt it was a very interesting point to be raising because we know that an increasing number of local authorities are offering parents um, personal transport budgets or petrol and oil payments and if anybody listening just wants to um, send in a quick email um, to, to tell us what the situation is like in their own local area. It would be very interesting to build a picture to understand what um, personal budget payments actually look like in different areas across the country. Um, in Wiltshire currently, the uh, personal transport budget payment is just over 41 pence a mile. Um, and it would be interesting to know how that compares around the, the, the country. So just as we're, we're tying up, um, it's now this afternoon, uh, if you do want to just ping that across, that would be really interesting to know. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Sorry, our slides have frozen. If you just bear with us, we will try and get our slides going again. There we go. Um, so this page is just to show you where we've taken a lot of the information from. Uh, we've referenced IPSI quite a lot in the, the slides today. Uh, and on screen, you can see details of IPSI's website. Um, also, we mentioned work by the STC, which is the School Transport Consultancy Organization. There are the website details there. A lot of the information, particularly the school transport inquiry, is on contacts website, and there are many articles by Steve Broach that are also on contacts websites. And those would cover a lot of uh, legal issues, and perhaps some of the legal questions that we've been asked today. So we'd like to end by thanking you all today for your your patience and and for bearing with us through this quite long webinar, but we do hope that it was useful um, and hopefully interesting in at least parts. Um, a short questionnaire will launch at the end of this webinar, and we'd like to ask you to take the time to complete this, as it will help us plan future online training events, including other topics that you would like to see. The recording of this webinar, the presentation and questions will be on the Parent Participation Resources page of Contacts website, hopefully next week, and an email confirming this will be sent to you once this is available. Thank you for your time today. Thank you.